Okay, next week we begin 1 John. Some came in and didn't know that and they were wondering when, next week. So I'm finishing, I'm gonna, the goal is to finish Proverbs today. I never know about the timing. See, normally I just can prepare enough that I go as far as I need to. But when it's the last class, you got to hit it on the nose. So I'm, I don't know if I'm going to finish too early, won't have enough time, but we'll see how that goes. But after that, we'll start 1 John, Lord willing, next week. And then we'll do 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And then after that, I have other ideas for classes. So if we live that long, that's what we'll do. Okay. Now, I want to carry on here. We're in the second Proverbs, what I'm doing, we went through the first nine chapters in detail, and now I'm giving you a sketch of a wise person, and I'm pulling a lot of different Proverbs together and organizing them in a way that makes sense to me. As I've said, sometimes you may say, well, that, that particular proverb would better fit somewhere else. Oftentimes, Proverbs fit in more than one category, and I repeat them, but uh, we're looking at this, and when we ended last week, it, we looked at general attitudes and characteristics, relationship. Uh, with his family of a wise person, his relationship with friends and neighbors, his speech. Now we're on miscellaneous topics. And we looked at bribes and gifts. And when we ended, we just looked at emotions and health. And I want to talk about wealth and poverty, particularly wisdom is associated with wealth. You see here, this one probably goes better with the one that uh, laziness leads to poverty, which I'll talk about next. And I mentioned that when we went through the first nine chapters. But here you say, whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. So if you're slothful, you're unwise, and you're going to be doing without. 1424, the crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. 224, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. And you can see also in 316 and 818 that we talked about when we went through the first nine chapters in some detail. So this idea that if you live wisely, if you live according to woman wisdom, that's living skillfully in God's world. That's not a guarantee that you'll be rich or have plenty, but there is a likelihood that if you conduct yourself according to God's principles, that things will go well with you. He says that you have riches and honor in life. And so that's one of the things. Now, the other side of that is that foolish behavior, especially laziness, is associated with poverty. That comes as no surprise. But you see, for example, 10.4, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. If you are lazy, if you will not work, if you don't care about work, if your goal is, I'm going to see how I can still get by by getting out of work, well, it's not going to go well for you. And you can see that in life. You can piece that together from just observing. 13.4, the soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. 24, the sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Why will he have nothing? Because he was too lazy. He didn't want to do anything. 22.16, Whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. Now, here you have this thing. This person, it's a little bit different what this person's doing. And I'll talk, I, I repeat this in the a, in a, a next few slides, maybe, maybe a few more after that, but I'll get back to this. That really doesn't fit here as well as some of the others. 24, 30 to 34. I pass by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard, of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So here he sees this, he goes by this field and it's just a mess. And he thinks about it and he says, ah, a person who will not work to clear the field and do these things, it's going to wind up like that. And so this person will, will not have the benefit of hard work. And we discussed this in chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. So this idea of working hard, you need to have this and you need to instill this in your children. I know parents, all, we all want to do that. 
It's not that easy. You know, but if you can do that, you're helping somebody live skillfully in God's world. Now, as I said uh, some weeks ago, when I first talked about this, Honor had brought up a caution, and I think it bears repeating, that as you work diligently and are blessed, it's easy to fall into the sense that this is by my hand. And you have to be careful about that. You are to work diligently, and God rewards diligent labor. But you have to be careful in thinking that these things are your achievement and your goal and not realize that God has given them to me. And the parallel is, is when Israel was going into the promised land and God tells them, you're going to get in there, everything's going to be going well, you're going to be in a good time, it's going to be rolling, it's going to be fat city, and you're going to say, by my hand I've gotten these things, and you're going to forget me. All right, so that's a caution that we always have to be aware of and concerned about. All right, wealth and poverty, uh, the wealth of fools will not last. And you see here it says, wealth gained hastily will, will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase. Now this, this gained hastily has this idea of a get-rich-quick scheme and probably implies shadiness. So this is a person who's not living wise. He's a person who's trying to get by and, and take from people and this kind of thing. Well, his wealth is not going to last because the same thing that led him to that is going to lead him to squandering and not planning and all these other things. So the people who aren't wise, their wealth won't last, but a wise person, a one who, who works diligently, who plans, and who has been influenced by woman wisdom, this person will, their wealth will increase. Now, again, proverbs, right? These are proverbs. They're not law. Many things can happen in life. God can discipline you. Other, God can be doing other things in your life. So you can't go to somebody and say, well, because you're in this situation, I know as a matter of fact that you're not wise. Okay. But, but these are proverbial. They're general truths. 1322, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. The sinner, the person who doesn't live wisely, is somebody whose wealth is going to be dissipated and taken. And so this is the idea on uh, <clears throat> the wealth of fools won't last. Next subcategory under wealth and poverty. Poverty can be caused by injustice and oppression. And it's important for those of us who have to know that. It's important. He says the fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. So not all poverty, you see, comes because of sloth. Sloth will bring poverty, generally. You can have a lazy person who can inherit a bunch. But generally speaking, if you are lazy, you won't gain things. But injustice and oppression can lead to that. And there's a temptation of people who are successful and who have to think that everybody who doesn't have is slothful. And we have to understand this idea. People can be oppressed, and there can be injustice at work. In 2216, whoever oppresses the poor, so we're back to that one that I, I kind of skipped. Whoever oppresses the poor to increase his own wealth or gives to the rich will only come to poverty. Now, what's going on here? This is a person who thinks that the way to get rich is to exploit the poor, to get rich off the poor, on their back, to oppress them, or to grease the palms of the wealthy. You see, ingratiate himself with the wealthy. That's his technique. And he says, this person's going to come to poverty. The way that you'll be blessed is to live wisely, and that is what? To give generously to the poor. We'll see that in a minute. Okay, so this person's going off on the wrong track. He thinks the way to wealth is to oppress the poor and extract it from them, or to grease the palms of the rich, and then they'll show him favor. And he says, that person's going to what? Come to poverty. That's not, that's not how you go about uh, gaining wealth in this world. The wise are generous to the poor. A lot on this. 1421, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. This is important. 1431, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. 
19.17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. 21.13, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. 28.27, whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. 31.20, this is the uh, exceptional wife. 31.20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. So in this sketch of a wise person, they give generously to the poor. They don't look at the poor as saying, too bad for you. No, they're generous to the poor. And that's an important thing about living wisely in God's world. Wisdom and righteousness are better than wealth. Now, this is a message, if you can drum this into somebody's head, this will go a long way in a good life, in generating and producing a good life. If you can get people to understand that life is about more than money, you see so much in our society just money crazed. Anything for money. Money's the be-all and end-all of existence. And that's simply not the case, and a wise person understands that. 1616, how much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Wisdom is more important than those things. If you drum that in, bravo. Uh, 286, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who's crooked in his ways. Now, you see people who make money in all kinds of illegal, shifty, all this kind of stuff, and our society thinks, who cares? They got money. But the wise person understands that what matters is your integrity. How you live is what's important, not your bank account. And if you know that, then that will go a long way in blessing you in this world. Wealth has limited value. 11.4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. You know, like, is it James 4, James 5? I didn't look. But at the end of James, you know, the, the, about the rich man, grieve, mourn, and wail uh, for the judgment that's coming. Do you think on judgment day that you wind up showing your bank account and saying, by the way, do you know how much money I have? Do you know that I have, you know, I'm in the top 1% of all people when it comes to wealth? Do you think that will matter? It will not. And yet, so many people live like that's really the key. Is can I outdo other people in how much my, my bank account, my bottom line? And that's not it. You see, in 1128, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. A good name, 22.1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. Wealth has limited value. Wealth is a good thing. It can be used. Uh, there are rich, righteous people, rich people of integrity. There are poor, righteous people. Okay? But wealth has limited value, and it very easily <laughs> takes a position in a person's life of being uh, a god, basically being the thing that we serve and live for and that occupies all of our mind and time, attention and all of that. And that becomes a real trap. But a wise person avoids that. A wise person avoids that. 23, 4, and 5. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings flying like an eagle toward heaven. You see, it's temporary. It's temporary. It's not something that's permanent. And this idea, don't toil, doesn't mean you don't work hard, obviously, because he's talking about people who will be diligent. They will be rewarded with wealth. He's talking about keeping it in the right perspective. Be discerning enough to desist. If money and wealth is your God, if that is all you live for, well, then that will come and wash over your life and take over everything. You won't care about your wife or your husband. You won't care about your children. You won't care about other things that are more important. All of them will get shelved to serve the God money. And it has to be kept in proper perspective because it is not permanent. 
You have to see that. You say, yeah, but you know, money buys me all. I know that. But you have to keep your perspective on it. 37 to 9. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Now, this is Agur, and he's giving here a prayer. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. That's the first thing he wants. Because truthfulness is important. We've looked at that in the sketch of the wise person, the general characteristics in his speech. We looked at that. Being a truth teller is important. That's part of living skillfully in God's world. But then he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, what's going on here? Well, he's telling you this prayer, and what I think he's doing, he's highlighting the temptation of poverty and riches. Because certainly there are rich, righteous people. And certainly there are poor people who do not uh, profane the name of God. In fact, poor people are generally connected to righteousness in Scripture. Now, why is that? Because generally the poor are the ones who recognize their need and they call out for God. So scripture oftentimes uh, ties them to righteousness and uses them as symbols of righteousness. So certainly they can be that way. What I think is being said here in this prayer is that it is a warning. It is a warning about the temptations that poverty and riches bring. When you are poor, there is a temptation to do these things, to steal. Okay, why? Well, think, listen, uh, everybody else has got stuff. I'm owed this stuff. And so it's okay for me to take it. It's not okay for you to take it. That's stealing. Okay, but that's a temptation, you see. When you're down on the bottom of the, of the material ladder and you're looking around, it's easy to be tempted into thinking, I can justify this because why should they have more than I have? And I need. So that's a temptation. And on the other hand, the idea of riches, of course, is this notion that when I have a lot, what do I need God for? You know, look, I have everything. And it's so easy to, to trust in wealth as being the source of your deliverance. If I'm in trouble, I have the money to get out of it. And this is why I say, no one, when you think about anything, nothing is in your hands. You may think that your wealth is secure. It's not. I don't care where you have it. I don't care if you have it in the stock market, you got it in bonds somewhere, you got it in the bank, you got it stuffed in your mattress, wherever it is, it's, something can happen to it. Something can happen to it. Oh, what could happen to it? You can lose it. Okay? You can lose it. And so you get the, that's helpful to know that. And that's not the source of, of your strength and this, this kind of thing. Okay, securing loans. Now we're under miscellaneous topics, sketch of a wise person. Now here's what uh, Proverbs has to say about securing loans. It has a lot to say about it. Okay, this is the idea where I come in and pledge, you know, you're going to make a loan to somebody, and I say, listen, you take my stuff and hold it, he'll pay you back, and then you'll give me back my stuff. Okay? Uh, well, this is not a wise move. And the, proverb, the uh, uh, wisdom teacher will tell us that. All right, 1115. Whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm, but he who hates striking hands in pledge is secure. Now, you know that we're to, we're to be generous to the poor, right? We are to give to the poor. We just looked at a bunch of Proverbs. What's this about? Well, this is the idea... That when you th you're thinking about this, look, I'm going to get this back. I really can't afford this, but I'm not really giving it. I'm simply giving it for security, and I'm going to get it back. Well, no, you very well may not get it back, and if you can't afford it, if you can afford it, just give it to him. If you can't afford it, don't put it up as security under the delusion that you're going to get it back. May you get it back? Yes, you may. But the wisdom teacher is telling you, if you have enough, you could give it without expecting return. But if you need it and you have to have it come back to you, don't secure it. Don't offer it as security. Don't give it to somebody who's going to be making a loan to somebody else based on what you give them. Because you'll wind up losing that, and you can't. Because if you could, you'd have given it. 
All right, that's the idea, and you see this a lot. One who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. 2016, take a man's garment when he's put up security for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for foreigners. Now, this seems to be directed to the lender. And the idea looks to be like saying, listen, somebody that stupid who will do that, you show them no mercy and you take the stuff. Now, I think that's ironic. And I think the point of that is, is he's saying, listen, if somebody is that foolish, then they, they have taking their stuff will cause them no further trouble if they're that foolish. I think because this seems to be directed to the, to the lender rather than the person securing. He says, 22, 26, and 27, be not one of those who gives pledges, who put up security for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from under you? Because this is what's going to happen. And you say, well, I, I didn't want to do that. I was just putting this up to help him out. I know that. But what happened? He didn't pay, so now you're paying. And you can't afford to pay. All right, 27, 13, take a man's garment when he has put up security for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for an adulteress, the same thing I talked about a minute ago. This seems directed to the lender, and it's essentially saying when somebody's that foolish, you go ahead and take their stuff. And the idea, I think, again, is ironic, is that if they're that foolish, then even losing that won't hurt them because they've already put their head in a blender. Okay? <laughs> I think that's the idea. Uh, you also see this same idea, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. Okay, miscellaneous topics. Now I want to go to miscellaneous proverbs. Okay, these I haven't grouped in topics, but these are just miscellaneous proverbs that I wanted to talk about. Like a gold ring and a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Okay, a gold ring. A pig is something in, in, in Jewish law, of course, unclean animal. Uh, un, it's uh, unclean, ritually unclean under Jewish law. And Jews had elevated the pig to like the, the quintessentially unclean animal. That this was a pig was it, you know. I mean, unclean, ritually unclean. So this gold ring is something that's expensive, it's beautiful, and it distracts a person from the true nature of the pig. And that's what this is. See, like a gold ring in a pig snout is beauty on a woman who lacks discretion, who has an undesirable character. Her beauty is a distraction from her undesirable character, her lack of sense or her lack of judgment. And so that's pretty insightful, isn't it? You see, is that all I see is the, is the gold ring. I don't recognize that that's a pig speaking morally. You see, all I see, I'm distracted by this gold ring. Well, that's how beauty functions, that I don't appreciate the flaws in character that are there. In 11.24, one gives freely yet grows all the richer, another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Well, this is the same thing we see in 2 Corinthians 9.6. Right? Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This is simply a principle that if you are a good steward, generally God can be doing other things. You see, God can be do, always can be doing other things, disciplining, teaching, other things. But generally, those who are generous, they get more. Why? Because you've shown yourself to God to be a good steward. You're somebody who manages his wealth in a way that brings him glory. So he says, here, keep it up. See, keep it up. 12.9, uh, better to be lowly and have a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. You see, this idea, reality counts more than show. So it's better to be lowly, but still at least have a servant, you see, than to play the big shot and act like you have great wealth and you're starving to death. You can't eat that fake reputation. See, the, the reality is more important than the pretense. And that's an important thing to know, right? I mean, you're trying, trying to impress people and all this stuff. The reality is more important. 12.10, uh, whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. So here a righteous person is so sensitive to the needs of other people, how they're doing, that it extends even to the life of his beast, his animal. You see, so it is not right to just be brutal to animals. Gratuitously brutal harmful, mean, nasty to animals. 
a righteous person is so empathetic and sensitive toward people that it extends even to his beasts. Okay? On the other hand, the wicked person is such that even his mercy is cruel. You see the opposite? The, the, the righteous person is so sensitive and so tuned in that he has concern for the beast. This person is so bad that even what is merciful winds up being cruel. Uh, 15, 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a, a fattened ox and hatred with it. You see, love is more important than all the finer things in life. Right? I mean, I don't care where you are, if, what you're eating in your household. If it's a place where there's no love, it's a bust. Okay? But modest food and all this kind of stuff in an environment where there's love and joy, companionship and appreciation of each other, take it in a minute. And so this is important. See, the wise person knows this. And you see this better. Instead of caring about, well, let me have the luxuries. Now, don't worry so much about that. Focus on the important thing. And that's the relationship. And that is where they're developing that love that's there. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirit. Now, spirit here stands for motives and intentions. And we can deceive ourselves about the nobility of our actions. I don't know if, you, you know, if, if this is your experience. I suspect it is if you have the least bit of introspection. That it's easy to fool ourselves into thinking that what we're doing is really something quite noble. We can deceive ourselves, but we can't deceive the Lord. You see, he knows the truth about our deepest motives, our deepest affections, our deepest attitudes, our deepest desires. He knows all of that. He knows even things that we won't admit to ourselves, things that we're suppressing and trying to deny, and that we're acting out here and trying. He knows those things. You see, and it's important that when you live your life, you understand that. If you understand that, do you see how that will bless your life? Because you will understand, listen, the Lord knows the truth about these things. I can't conceal and hide these things from God. 17.3, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold. And the Lord tests hearts. These metal workers, they, they, they separate impurities from gold and silver by heating the metal until the dross, the bad stuff, could then come up and be poured off. Well, God puts such... A, puts us in situations that will reveal the quality and character of our faith. You see, it's the same idea of testing. That we're in situations, he tests our hearts. He gives us the opportunity to pass through difficulties to show and to reveal what is our heart really like. And if it shows that our heart is, uh, has dross, well, then we need to pour it off. You see, and so the Lord will do that. The Lord does test us in that way. 18.2, uh, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Fool doesn't care to learn anything. Already knows everything. Anybody who's tried to teach understands this. You see, that some people, do, it doesn't matter. You don't have anything, you know, you don't have anything to tell anybody. You simply don't. And so what are they interested in? They don't want to labor to understand things. They simply want to hear themselves talk. It is important to know that in life. Okay? That will, that will uh, hold you in good stead. Sometimes you'll see that. you say, okay, <laughs> this is part of what I understand about life. There are people who do not want to understand things. They simply want to talk. All right, well, you file that away. Okay, file that away, and that will, that will be beneficial. 1817, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Now, this is the idea that evidence, see, it's a warning, a caution against making hasty judgments. You see, evidence has to be probed. It has to be tested to determine its reliability. So you go and read something on Wikipedia. And you're, oh, yeah, I know what's going on. You see, there's a level of discernment and stuff, and I oftentimes pull what little hair I have out, I pull whatever hair I have left out, because there's, there seems to be a difficulty with people in being able to assess what is credible, what is not, uh, and this is something that's lacking very much. So it's this idea of, listen, you need to 
not make hasty judgments, but probe and test evidence and things to determine its reliability. If you see this here, you go and you look further and you pull in different things and you read and you do this and talk and you see it's a process and that's important. Otherwise you sit and go, I, yeah, said this and I'm taking that to the bank. You can't take that to the bank. You see? Now if it's somebody who's trustworthy who's just telling you a fact, okay. But this is important to, to know in life. 25, the purpose of a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. I think this means that a wise person, he's able to get a person to show his hand. You see, there are deep waters. There are all kinds of ulterior motives and agendas and things that are, that are motivating people in action. And a wise person is able to surface those things. You see, and that's good. Because then you can get down to what's really going on. And I think that's what he's talking about there. That these, there are deep things, but a person of understanding can ultimately uh, bring those things to the surface so they can be dealt with. 29, who can say, I've made my heart pure, I am clean from sin? The wise person needs to know that even though he may be righteous in a relative sense, righteous as Job was righteous, and sometimes we have an aversion to saying anybody's righteous. Nobody's righteous. I understand nobody's righteous absolutely, but there is such a thing as relatively righteous, right? I mean, you can see people in the Bible described as righteous even though they are sinful. So there is a relative righteousness. But the point here is that the person needs to know that though they may be righteous in that relative sense, they are not free from sin. You see, because being blind to one's sin leads one to ignore it and also leads one to cease trusting in the Lord's mercy. See, whenever you get to that point where you're thinking, not only am I relatively righteous, thanks be to God, but man, I'm, you know, I've arrived. I'm, I'm, I've arrived. I don't really need God's ongoing mercy in my life to stand. Well, then you've gone crazy. You see, you've lost your mind if you ever think that. And a quick look in the mirror, the inside, you know, uh, that should dispel that. Uh, 23.17, uh-oh. Uh, let, uh, let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all day. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, right? You're thinking, listen, man, I, here I am serving God, and I'm looking at this guy, and he's a crack dealer, and he's got a big house and a fancy car. Okay? Don't envy sinners. You see? Don't. Uh, that's no way to be, because there's nothing greater than being in a relationship with God. Uh, 25, 2, and 3. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. God has many mysteries in creation. You could ask Honor as she spends her uh, life searching out the complexities of biology. They're mind-blowing. Completely. Absolutely. Mind-blowing. And that's just one little slice. And here we are. No, we know everything. I think, Come on. It's like... You want to drill down, drill down, drill down, and your mind will be blown. You want to go up, 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 your mind will be blown. Okay, so God has these mysteries, and that's to his glory, but the glory of kings is to search things out. See, the, the glory of kings, it is, it's their thing, their, their praise for knowing what's going on, for being well-informed with regard to matters of governance and also regard to the mysteries of life. You see, that's the glory of a king, to be a wise ruler and, to, and see things. And then the second one, it says, As the heavens uh, for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. This is a warning. First, that you not try to psychoanalyze the king, if you're a wise person who happens to be in the king's presence, and that you not think you have the king figured out and you're going to bank on that. I can play the king. This is dangerous business. You just take the king as a black box. You see, you just take the king as you don't know what's going on in the king. That's the way to operate, because you don't. The king has a lot of stuff going on, and if you think you've got him figured out, and you can do something with him, and now I can get around him, and I can manipulate him, and all, you'll wind up dead. All right, uh, 25, 6, and 7. Uh, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it's better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. That sounds like Jesus' teaching, right? You want to come up here and say, hey, here I am. A guy says, no, you get back there. All right. No, it's better to be back there and then have somebody say, 
Come on up. Right? Uh, 2520. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on, vinegar on soda. See, this idea, you're aggravating the situation. Somebody whose heart is heavy, somebody who has suffered a loss, somebody, let's say they've learned their child has cancer, their child has been killed, and you come, hey, hey, you know, everything's great, hey, isn't it great? Well, do you think that's beneficial to that person? No, it's, it's just tremendously burdensome for the person. The thing that has to be done with the sufferer is that you sit with them. You suffer with them. And that's what he's talking about. See, it's like taking off a garment on a cold day. It's making the situation worse. It's like this reaction you get when you mix vinegar and soda. Uh, 2526, like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. You see, a clear spring, a clear fountain is something that's good, even life-giving. Well, that's how a righteous person is. But if you muddy up that water, it then becomes undrinkable and therefore is no longer valuable and life-giving. If a righteous person who is valuable and life-giving giving compromises with the wicked, then he too is of no value. You see, it's just like what Jesus said about the unsalty salt. You see... If the person loses his saltiness, his distinctiveness, if he compromises with evil, then what good is he? You see, and that's what I think is being said here. Uh, 26, 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. I've talked about this a number of times. There, this is all timing. There are some situations and circumstances in which it is necessary or wise and right to answer a fool. There are other times when it's not. And part of wisdom is being able to tell which is which. You see, it's which is which. There are some times when it's right. Other times you're just wallowing in the mud. Other times when it's necessary uh, to be beneficial to people. And it's not always easy to tell when it applies. 2617, whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. You see, this is something that, the point is that it's a stupid thing to do. Because the assumption is that the dog is mean and he will bite you. You see, he'll bite you. If you butt into a fight, you're asking for trouble. Now, isn't that good advice? I mean, shouldn't somebody know that? Living in this world, hey, I think I'll just jump in the middle of everybody's fight. Don't do it. It's like grabbing that dog. Okay, it's not a smart thing to do. 2620, for lack of, of wood, the fire goes out, and where there's no whisperer, quarreling ceases. You know there are people like this, right, who sit here and say, it's almost like they don't like peace. It's like, pss, pss, did you hear that? Oh, yeah. Uh-oh, things are quiet. I've got to come over and stir up trouble. Okay? You know what he said? Oh, yeah, I heard him say this. Come over here. You know what that person said? Oh. All right, that's what's being talked about. Uh, not to be that way. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. So here's a situation of, of uh, you know, the evil that we dish out to others has a way of coming back on us. We have our own proverb. What goes around comes around. That's our proverb. Of course, in our society, nobody would know that uh, somebody beat them to it a long time ago. <laughs> you see, but this is the idea, because you treat what you deal out to people sets how they perceive you. You see, so these things wind up coming back on you. Uh, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. The future is not in your hands. It's easy to forget. No, no, life goes on. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But every now and then we get these stark reminders. By the way, this happened to somebody. This person had a heart attack. This person dropped dead of an aneurysm. This person's life was turned on a dime. Okay, you, you just don't. You and I are here and we're on a mission, and we're doing something, but our future is not in our hands. Uh, 25, 7, 5, and 6. Better an open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. I've talked about that, so I'm just going to fly by it. Crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and a man is tested by his praise. And here's another example of this, being tested by praise. You see, a man's character is tested by his praise because it reveals whether he suffers from pride or deceit. Testing is revealing. You see, now, praise and encouragement, I've said, these are important things. We're, we're told to do them. And people need to be encouraged. But the person being encouraged will be tested, 
and has to be careful that this doesn't become a cause for him or her to think they're the greatest thing going. It's easy to let that spill over into a big head. So the, the, the notion is, is you are to extract from it the strengthening that God intends while warding off the inflation of ego. All right, now that's not always easy to do. In fact, there was a story somebody said, somebody was up complimenting somebody. I didn't look it up. I can't remember the preacher. But he was complimenting, and the guy said something like, I have gunpowder in my chest, and you're waving a torch in front of it. You see, that's the idea. But we are to encourage, and we are to help people, uh, because we do need that. Wicked, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked, they have no God to protect them. So even when there's not a fight, they're taken off. Uh, the righteous are bold because they stand in the power of the Lord. That's what that's about. 29.18. There is no, where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. When there's no revelation from God, no word of God, the people run wild. We, are, we run and do the things that we want when we don't think that we're under uh, God's will or that God is speaking or that God is holding us accountable. We then say, well, uh, I think I'll just live the way I want. And he says here in the second part, but blessed is he who keeps the law. You see, it's a blessing and it's a good thing. It'll bless your life. Okay, uh, got about a minute to do the last year. Excellent wife, so I'm going to have to fly through this. Uh, let me, I'm, I'm, I was going to read it and go back through it, but let me just comment on a few things here. Uh, this is an, this, the excellent wife, it's an acrostic. Okay, so this, what that means is that you have 22 lines or 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each of the lines begins with a successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So it would be like first line's A, second line's B, C, of course, Hebrew letters. All right, so that's, that's what you have going on there, uh, straight, straight down. Now, this woman, is she's, not, uh, she's well off, but she's not elite because she does jobs that normally, if you were very rich, you'd have somebody else doing them. But let me say one thing. At least I got to this. I don't know how much I'll be able to get through. But this amazingly energetic and competent woman, I'm still going to say this, uh, it's an ideal. Okay, it's an ideal. She is the dream wife of that particular culture. That's all you, you see. I mean, held up as an ideal package of a wife for that particular culture. Not everyone will have all the gifts or all the resources that she has. So not everyone can do all that she does. So you have women who read this thing and they feel terrible. Say, listen, understand that's the ideal. We can all learn from the description by seeing that she is a blessing to her husband, her children, and her household. And I wish I had time to bring out some of these things because they're pretty neat. But I do have, uh, I'm going to revise it. I'll put up uh, the notes and so you can see at least what I think about the excellent wife. But uh, that's all the time. Next week, First John, thank you for coming.